introduce yeah so uh, good evening dear friends so uh, as you know uh, uh, today is our 40th episode of apollo mumbai critical care learning network and uh, today's topic is community acquired pneumonia from the intensivist prospect so basically this topic uh, is very uh, one of the uh, you can say the important topic for almost all the intensivists because as you know like uh, the last uh, wave of epidemics uh, of covid so everybody had suffered one or more similar uh, uh, incidences in their lifetime and the intensivists should know when the patient is become critical and he comes to the icu and how to manage it and uh, what are the different other methods of treating the community of pneumonia so it is basically a burning topic nowadays specifically when now the influenza and uh, the h1n1 is also spreading like anything so probably uh, uh, the, the the focus is on severely ill critically patients who are coming to the icu and today we have our esteemed speaker dr barnali datta from medanta hospital gurgaon she is instrumental in uh, uh, describing this topic in in our own way and uh, hopefully this will throw some light on the current management of uh, patients with community acquired pneumonia so madam is a chest physician consultant uh, chest specialist and practicing uh, you can say the chest physician come intensivist in the medanta hospital uh, gurgaon and uh, with this uh, my co colleague dr akhilesh is there and uh, i welcome you all myself dr gunadhar from apollo hospital navi mumbai senior consultant critical care medicine specialist so uh, so without uh, much delay let's start the topic and hope this topic will be very much interesting and uh, it will be helpful for our dnb fellows practicing intensivist and uh, other who are practice uh, who are giving the exams in the coming days so i request all of you to put your questions in the chat box at the end of the talk madam will take uh, and we'll both discuss one by one the uh, your questions thank you so over to you madam thank you thank you dr gunadha uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, and before i start the talk i'll just um, just one submission that i probably will be coming more from a, a pulmonary perspective so apologies in advance for that i think community acquired pneumonia while of course the severe cases will always be um, you know directed to the intensive care under the care of the intensivist but there is many uh, steps before that so i'll go over everything if there are any gaps in the understanding then of course dr gunadhar and dr aklesh are there too Uh, do that so i'll begin with screen sharing so community acquired pneumonia uh so these are the guidelines that i have derived from the latest guidelines that we have are actually from the ats american thoracic society and the infectious disease society of america which is from 2019 uh, they have further guidances on influenza covid bts the british thoracic society is a bit old 2009 indian guidelines are also there from 2016 uh, i have taken some uh, some from from the anesthesia perspective but uh, more i again uh, reiterate is from the pulmonary perspective and then up to date is a source that we all go to which has uh, of course everything under one heading so the scope of talk what is community acquired pneumonia uh, what is the clinical presentation uh determining severity this becomes very important diagnosing it and determining severity because based on that we then decide do we admit or not and after admission does the patient need icu or not so the sick cohort who land up in icu are the ones that you will be dealing with uh, whereas in the pulmonary perspective we often deal with them in the outpatient setting or sometimes even in uh, in the wards of course the treatment and duration and a few you know special cases follow up and things like that what antibiotics about the bacteria in more detail so what is community acquired pneumonia it it refers to acute infection of the lung parenchyma which is acquired in the community which is outside the hospital this is different to nosocomial pneumonia which we often recognize and perhaps what you see more often in the icu setting which includes both hospital acquired and ventilator acquired pneumonia and this is within a 48 hours of you know, either admission 48 or more than or more than 48 hours of intubation so this is different to community acquired pneumonia where the um, infection has been picked up in the community uh healthcare uh, associated pneumonia has now the term has been made redundant uh, and i'll just make one point about it it has it is now abandoned but it was 
taken up as an entity wherein it's a uh, it's an infection which is picked up in the community, but with drug resistant bugs. And this is because of uh, either recent hospitalization or because of uh, staying in a nursing home long term facility because of dialysis. And so continued exposure to healthcare setup, which led to um, resistant bugs. However, it was found after this entity that uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, needless increase in the use of uh, drugs. So that's why it has been abandoned. Now, um, as Dr. Uh, Gunadhar pointed out, community acquired pneumonia, it is a very, it is a very important topic. Why so? Because uh, it is an infection that ranges from just a simple cough and cold in a healthy immunocompetent young man uh, to very, you know, a very critical illness where patients are then in ICU and, you know, often uh, life threatening. So that is why that whole spectrum, we need to understand what causes it. Uh, we need to identify the sick patients quickly and then institute the correct antibiotics quickly without overusing, underusing, abusing, misusing, et cetera, which as you know, antibiotic, you know, that is a very uh, key thing for us because we've lost out on very, key antibiotics because of uh, improper use. And I think antibiotic stewardship is now a very, uh, you know, is, is something that is in every hospital and every ICU. Now, clinical presentation that we uh, would see of any patient, cough and sputum production will be there, you know, in 90%. More important than that is fever. Now, fever is the key thing when we suspect pneumonia, like many patients can come with cough and, you know, they, it can be airway disease, it can be bronchitis, it can be so many other things. But when it is associated with fever, then we think of an infective cause. Chills may be there, depending on the level of illness. Now, again, as it's mentioned here, fever is not so common in older people and older people immunocompromised, et cetera. So uh, again, we need to have that understanding that not every patient will have fever, but in a, by and large, 90% will have fever. Tachypnea, sometimes pleuritic chest pain, if, it's on a, if the pneumonia is on an edge and there's pleural inf um, inflammation and pleurisy, then of course there can be a degree of pleuritic chest pain. Auscultation uh, will uh, have lots of chest uh, crackles, uh, crackles, and then we can have, uh, sometimes you can get a bronchial breath sound because of the consolidated lung uh, parenchyma in which there's patent airway. And so the bronchial breath sound is transmitted. The first thing to point out is that you need an X-ray to diagnose pneumonia. You know, if your X-ray doesn't show pneumonia, doesn't so show consolidation, then you cannot say this is pneumonia. Then it could be bronchitis, it could be LRTI, URTI, or any number of those kind of basket diagnosis. But pneumonia requires you to have consolidation. And that is the, um, that is the typical understanding of this. What are the risk factors of, uh, for developing community acquired pneumonia? You know, why is it that not everyone will develop it? Why are some people more prone to it? And these are the risk factors which, are, um, which apply across the board for any acute infection. So this is pneumonia, but it could be the same for you know, respiratory illnesses, for any other illnesses. Age is a very key factor. Older age, chronic comorbidities, so anything, chronic kidney disease, heart disease, liver disease, anything that you're living with will make you more susceptible. Viral respiratory tract infection. Now, this is a very important thing because as we know, the viral uh, infection in the lungs can, you know, severe infections can even present as pneumonia. Um, but additionally, they can pull down your immunity so that you get secondary superadded bacterial infections. Smoking and alcohol overuse, other lifestyle factors, which is you know, socioeconomic more than anything else, and then a combination of any of these risk factors. These are important for you to know in your history taking because you are then uh, gearing up to know what you're dealing with. Could this patient become severe, even though he isn't right now? You know, what, what is the prognostic uh, factors for these patients? So risk factors are important for us to acknowledge. Then we come to this very important thing of who to admit. Now, this is not relevant to the intensivist so much as the uh, you know, the, the, the physician, the uh, pulmonologist or the internal medicine physician who's sitting in the OPD. Clinical severity, which we will discuss in detail, is one of the key things that we need to look at. But other than clinical severity, you have to take a holistic view of a patient and decide on admission. Like, for example, 
are the, if there's a medical psychosocial contraindication to outpatient therapy. And this can, again, be numerous things. Inability to maintain oral intake. So, you know, then we may need to give intravenous and things like that. History of substance abuse, cognitive impairment, severe comorbid illnesses and impaired functional status. So again, it boils down to the same thing that you have to see the patient in totality. You're not dealing with one single thing. Now coming to this clinical severity. Now there are two key uh, severity scores and I'm sure you're familiar with these and I will just go over them in a little bit of detail. So pneumonia severity index. This has multiple variables. So these are the key variables, which has several uh, you know, paths to it. So patient characteristic, coexisting illness, which we already discussed. These risk factors are very key. Any chronic disease, as we can see here, physical examination findings become very important. So respiratory rate, blood pressure, uh, you know, temp fever, heart rate, if you're confused, altered status of the uh, mental status, and then lab findings. So clearly we are looking at, um, you know, we have the blood reports, we have the x-ray, and then we are taking a call whether we need to admit the patient or not. Lab findings, um, pH, sodium, urea, hematocrit, blood glucose, and the actual oxygen level and radiological finding of pleural effusion. So, so this is what PSI uses. And with all, all of these are given scores from 10 to 30, and this is added up. And then it is broken into classes, divided into classes. The, so class one and two is anything under 70, and this is low risk and can undergo outpatient treatment. Three becomes intermediate and you may want to admit. And four and five, you admit and you also consider whether he needs more high-end treatment preferably ICU. They say preferably ICU, so bear that in mind. The second one is CURB-65. Now CURB-65, of course, is something that is used because it is very easy to use. You know, you and I can be sitting in, can be in emergency or in OPD and just look at this patient and do it then and there. So CURB-65 refers to confusion, a certain level of urea, respiratory rate, blood pressure, and age more than 65. So these are the various things. And the, then you have here the actual numbers and each of these points is given one, a score of one. So then you add it up. Once you've added it up, how do you do a risk stratification? Low risk is zero and one. So you can you know, do outpatient treatment. If it is two, then you may have to consider, okay, may need a short inpatient stay kind of thing. And then three and above, three, four, five, definitely needs admission, perhaps even intensive admission, intensive care. So these are the two scores commonly used and which one is recommended. Now, what the ATS and IDSA guidelines say is that PSI gets a bit more weightage. It shows a bit more. So they have done extensive uh, meta-analyses on these and PSI is uh, more robust, more safe. And it increases more safely, increases the proportion of patients who can be treated in the OPD. It also guides the initial site of treatment of patients without uh, increasing the mortality or any other outcome. And so evidence supports the effectiveness safety of using this PSI to guide the initial site. CURB-65, although uh, a good clinical tool, is a little less than PSI. One thing to point out, though, is that PSI and CURB-65 were not designed to help select the level of care needed by a patient hospitalized for CAP. Although we do use it, that if it is a high score, yes, the patient will probably require intensive care, but this is not why it was devised. There are separate scores which are done for that. So this is to, where is the patient best uh, treated at home or in hospital? And once in hospital, then again, you have to reassess which is the best place for the patient, in a ward or in ICU. So these are the two scores. Now coming to who to admit to ICU, which becomes very relevant for yourselves who are treating the intensive care patients. Now, 2007, the IDSA ATS criteria for defining severe community acquired pneumonia, this is what is even currently applicable in the 2019 update that we have. So it divides it to major criteria, minor criteria. There are nine minor criteria and there are two major criteria. Major criteria is very straightforward, septic shock requiring vasopressors. Of course, that is for ICU. Respiratory failure requiring ventilation. Of course, that's for ICU. So these are very kind of, you know, uh, very black and white scenarios. No uh, need to think too much about that. 
Minor criteria, there are numerous. Respiratory rate, oxygen requirement of the patient, multi-lobar infiltrates, confusion, disorientation, a certain level of urea, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, hypothermia, hypotension. All of these are, uh, are kind of uh, clinical parameters which, will, which uh, definitely will ring the alarm bell bells for us. So it says, what is severe community acquired pneumonia? Either one major criteria or three or more minor criteria. So yeah, you can take it from that. So this is the uh, this is uh, how, how one looks at the uh, IDSA ATS. Now for these uh, counts thing leukopenia, it is uh, it should be because of the sepsis, not chemotherapy induced. There's a second score called Smart Cop. This is an alternative validated prediction rule for ident identifying patients with pneumonia. Again who may require ICU, which is vasopressor support or mechanical ventilation. Um, how does this work? Smart Corp is an abbreviation. So systolic BP, multilobar, X-ray involvement, albumin, respiratory rate, tachycardia, confusion, oxygen levels. Again, they're calculating the actual requirement and arterial pH. And then this is again, the, again, you score it as per these one or two points, and then you make a total. And then uh, this is how we uh, decide low risk, moderate or high or very high risk. And then this is how it is used. So which to use, which fares better. Now, again, these have been uh, extensively studied and subjected to meta-analysis. Uh, SmartCorp has eight criteria and IDSA ATS has nine minor criteria and five have an overlap. So to, this means that they are roughly looking at the same thing and we derive the same information from them. So when, when they do the pooled sensitivity and specificity, so ATS ID, IDSA, it's 84% sensitivity and 78% specificity. Um, the, if you use only the minor criteria, then the sensitivity comes down significantly. And in smart cop, uh, sensitivity 79 and specificity 64. So again, we are leaning towards this. This is a good way to judge whether a patient will need uh, ICU care. So these, I think these are important to be aware of because this is exactly the decision making that may be life-saving for the patient. Timely intervention and we take the patient to the right place. You know, we are not thinking, uh, can we do in the ward and things like that. So immediately take to ICU. Now coming to chest x-ray. Now this is something you're all very familiar with and, uh, but it always helps to discuss some, you know, the simple things because to me, a chest x-ray is a very vital thing for a pulmonologist, for intensivist, because this gives us so much information. Now, if you look at it, dense, patchy, white opacity. So that's what we see on a chest x-ray. Could be unilateral or bilateral. Bilateral is obviously much worse. Alveolar opacity. Now, uh, these fluffy opacities, they are alveolar opacities. And what do they indicate? That the air in the alveolar has been replaced by exudate. Now, in pneumonia, it is exudate. But bear in mind the differentials. There could be blood, which is pulmonary hemorrhage. That could, there could be fluid, which is pulmonary edema, et cetera. But, you know, when there is bilateral. But in, uh, in, in, the, in the correct clinical scenario, obviously, it is a consolidation pneumonia. And this is just to highlight air bronchogram. Again, the, the patent bronchus, which is surrounded by a consolidated lung. And uh, this, is the, this is almost a uh, sin qua non for consolidation or pneumonia. And this is the kind of patients that you all will see in ICU very often with bilateral pneumonia, with the endotracheal tube, with monitoring wires and things like that. So this is, we know straight away, this is a much sicker patient who requires uh, mechanical ventilation. Coming to other tests. Now, I will discuss a little more about X-rays that is going forward, but what are the other diagnostic tests in severe community-acquired pneumonia? Now, these are tests which will not necessarily be done in the inpatient, in a ward, in the ward setting. Definitely not in the outpatient setting, but in ICU, all of these become very relevant. So the first thing is blood cultures. In a patient in ICU with, uh, uh, with bilateral or unilateral pneumonia, sick enough to be in ICU, possibly on ventilator, inotropes, et cetera, uh, definitely blood cultures will be done uh, because these, these are sick patients and you know, we need to, uh, whatever identifies a bacteria will always uh, guide our antibiotic therapy. Sputum, gram stain and culture, if it is possible, then it is uh, very useful again. Respiratory viral panel. Now, this is something that increasingly we are all doing, um, especially in, uh, uh, in 
maybe intubated patients or even, uh, we certainly won't do it in outpatient uh, or nor on sputum samples, best done on respiratory secretions that come from within. So either ET tube secretions or a bowel sample. And respiratory uh, viral panel, I think is an excellent um, way for us to identify a whole uh, gamut of uh, you know, uh, organisms, viral, atypical, typical, et cetera. What about these antigens, urinary antigen for streptococcus pneumoniae? It can be done in ICU setting. Legionella can be done in ICU setting in sick patients, as well as where there is a possible history of exposure, uh, of travel, of staying in hotels, and of others falling sick as well, et cetera. Bronchoscopy, again, this is reserved for sick patients where we can't identify the uh, bacteria, patient is not getting better, et cetera. Uh, blood parameters. Now, obviously, I'm not going to go into the details of the, you know, the, the routine hemogram and kidney function, liver function, all that is going to be done regardless. You know, you will monitor in an ICU setting, you will monitor in a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, these are looking at blood parameters. Will this help you make any decision in the pneumonia? So procalcitonin. All of us use it very commonly in the sepsis, in the setting of sepsis infection, you know, to know how much it is and things like that. In the guidelines, they have recommended procalcitonin to maybe consider to differentiate between viral and bacterial. So CRP, for example, used to be a parameter that we used to use a lot, and we still do. You know, it gives us a broad, it's a non-specific inflammatory marker, no doubt, but again, it tells us the burden of infection. So procalcitonin in a similar way, what they have said is that less than 0.1 mg per liter may indicate viral, and if it is higher, then it may indicate bacterial. However, however, the sensitivity to detect bacterial infection ranges from as low as 38% to 91%. So again, simply based on the procalcitonin, you can't decide is it viral or bacterial and therefore not give the correct treatment of antibiotics. So I think that is the only takeaway from this. So we can do it for monitoring purposes for our, you know, for corroborate, it kind of corroborates our initial diagnosis, but it cannot be the test for the judgment. You know, that I think we will have to use other things. Now coming to the bacteria. Now this is very crucial, as, as we all know. Uh, community acquired pneumonia is very different uh, to hospital acquired pneumonia, bacteria, VAP, bacteria. However, there is overlap because you know we get a patient with community acquired pneumonia who is sick, and as they are recovering, they may also get super added hospital acquired, ventilator acquired. So it, ultimately, you know, all of us have experienced these kind of sick patients who have multiple, you know, bacteria. But the relevance of the community acquired infection is in that first five days of treatment. So it's divided into the causative bacteria or, you know, uh, or organisms. So the first is the typical bacteria. The most common is streptococcus pneumoniae, and we know this. Haemophilus influenzae is a second, Moraxilla catarralis, then Staph aureus, then other group A streptococci. Some gram-negative bacteria and bacteria see like Klebsiella or E. coli, but this is again, as we are aware, that is more so in a hospital setting. If they do get it in the community, which is you know much much uh, lower down as the causative agent, it'll be a sensitive bacteria rather than the uh, drug-resistant bacteria that we see in the uh, hospital setting. And then sometimes anaerobes and things which is associated with aspiration. So I'll go over a couple of the bacteria, not too much. This is something you can get in any textbook, but a few pointers. Streptococcus pneumoniae being the commonest, I think it's important we know about it. It's a gram positive, as we know, it's capsulated and it's a diplococcus and it comes in chains. This is a, just a simple you know, um, depiction of that. It colonizes our nasopharynx. Five to 10% of healthy adults will have uh, it in the nasopharynx. And you know, it's, it's fine till you become immunocompromised or sick in any other way, and then it can go on to cause infection. The capsule is the key uh, thing about it of virulence and antibodies against this capsule is what will enable killing of the bacteria. Risk of infection is highest in elderly, immunocompromised, uh, asplenia, remember that, hyposplenia, these are key things. They all need pneumococcal vaccine for this reason because they are much more prone to streptococcus, uh, to pneumococcal infection. It is usually penicillin sensitive, although of course in our current age of drug resistance, we will find that many will be resistant as well, but there are other antibiotics that can deal with it. Streptococcus pneumoniae, despite being the earliest, you know, the commonest, and uh, now of course, you know, perhaps it is, uh, things are better and the incidence in the West is lesser because of the vaccination, but 
you know, uh, it can even a healthy young person if they get streptococcus pneumonia can develop life threatening illness. So, so we have to respect these bacteria and how uh, you know virulent they can be. Staph aureus again, it's a common one that we deal with all the time. Normal commensal of skin and nasopharynx. It is also a gram positive diplococcus, but it's like grip, like it's like it's in clusters. It's not in chains. It's coagulase positive staph aureus, which differentiates it from the negative. They all produce beta lactamase, and so they are resistant to penicillin. So penicillins uh, will not work. A few like methicillin, um, oxacillin, flucloxacillin, these may work against it, but not the uh, standard penicillins that we use to treat uh, streptococcal pneumonia. What is the threat we have? It's MRSA. You know what we are all familiar with. It is called methicillin resistant staph aureus. And um, as, as we know, this is again, one of the hospital acquired bacteria that we uh, deal with a lot of the time. And this is sensitive to a different group of antibiotics uh, like vancomycin, linezolid, uh, tycoplanin, et cetera. Staph aureus may follow influenza illness and can be very severe. It's one of the things that we, uh, you know, it's one of those uh, bacteria that can cause very intense illness. Community acquired MRSA pneumonia remains low, but you know you see it once in a while. And then uh, pantenvalin leukocidin PVL toxin producing MRSA results in the cutaneous lesions and severe necrotizing pneumonia, which sometimes you see it is from the pneumonia, but very severe. Now, maybe it is not so much relevant in clinical practice, but these are some of the things to be aware of. Now, I'll just uh, show one case. Again, not a detailed case, but just very briefly. So this is again, patient in ICU. Uh, bilateral pneumonia, so in the right side and the left side, so multi multi low bar multifocal consolidation. So this is a middle aged woman, and when she came, we got uh, a, we did a bronchial bronchial lavage because she wasn't getting better. And as you can see, we uh, we grew staph aureus, and then this is the antibiotic sensitivity, resistant to benzyl penicillin. So this is typical of staph aureus; it'll be resistant to penicillin groups sensitive to oxacillin. So this is anyway, I won't go into detail in this because this is very much veering towards a microbiological thing. So you can have MRSA from the community. You can have oxacillin sensitive MRSA, et cetera. But in any case, it is resistant to a few of these, sensitive to all the MRSA antibiotics. <coughs> Received appropriate treatment and then developed you know, the, what we typically see, the gram-negative uh, bacteria. And this is what I think we all dread in the ICU setting, an MDR bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, Klebsiella pneumoniae, a Pseudomonas, Acentobacter. We are familiar with all of them, and these are, uh, you know, very much what we see. And uh, this is the reason why I think it is so important for us to be uh, very judicious with the antibiotics we are using, because we have already uh, lost the carbapenem group and now we have, you know, therefore now the some newer antibiotics, digicycline and ceftriaxone, EGTA, salbactam. Unfortunately, we don't have the MIC here. So there are something, and we have uh, polymix in colistin. But again, it's you know rapidly developing uh, drug resistance. So this is what we have to really be careful against. This, of course, as I say, is the overlap between you know community acquired pneumonia going then into developing into hospital acquired. So community acquired pneumonia, the bacteria causing it is relevant for the first five to seven days. After that, the antibiotics are to be attuned to what follows. The consequences of the pneumonia, like the sepsis, the organ failure, the ARD, that is a different matter. But the bacteria per se, the antibiotics relevant to that bacteria is only so for the first initial five days. This is more of community acquired pneumonia, so streptococcus pneumonia. You can see that it is uh, sensitive to penicillin, cephalosporins. These are the standard antibiotics, the beta lactam antibiotics, as we call it, and then uh, sensitive to all of these uh, here as well, uh, resistant to fluoroquinolones and a few others. So this would be much more uh, consistent with a standard community acquired pneumonia. Second is Haemophilus influenza. Again, uh, sensitive to the standard uh, penicillin, uh, amoxicillin, et cetera. Uh, augmenting that we would use to the cephalosporins. Now, Haemophilus becomes relevant because this is the commonest bacteria affecting patients of COPD and uh, lung disease, COPD being the most um, prevalent lung disease, chronic lung disease that we see. And Haemophilus influenza is the commonest uh, bacteria in the COPD setting. So these are again, easy to deal with, with the usage of the correct antibiotic. And we must 
must follow the tiered approach. You know, we can't just jump and give the highest end antibiotic, which is why we are in this, uh, you know, situation at the moment, because even small nursing homes will all give, you know, meropenem and colistin straight away, and we mustn't do that. We must follow the stepwise approach. And uh, the minute we identify a bacteria, narrow right down, narrow the antibiotic treatment right down from starting with broad spectrum, narrow, narrow it down to the bacteria that you... Now, this is coming to the, uh, again, the panel that all of us are familiar with. It is a multiplex, uh, it's a reverse transcriptase uh, PCR. So it's an amplification uh, process that will uh, amplify the, you know, the, the genetic material, the antigenic material from the virus or the uh, bacteria. And uh, this gives us a better idea, for example, here. So cultures will not always grow everything and 50% uh, of uh, CAP organism is identified. So uh, we have to use whatever we have uh, in order to do this because even viruses nowadays have become so relevant. Uh, so we do need to use whatever we have. Uh, now coming to atypical bacteria. Now, why are they called atypical bacteria? There, there are several causes for this. Atypical is, uh, so I'll read out from here, the resistance of these organisms to beta lactams, they cannot be seen on microscopy, nor can they be cultured. So these are the ideal organisms to be identified by the, uh, by the PCR, uh, by serology or by PCR. They are sensitive to antibiotics other than beta lactams like macrolides, tetracyclines, fl fluoroquinolones, and they're concentrated intracellularly where they replicate. From a clinical perspective, atypical refers to something else. From a clinical perspective, uh, these patients may often present with other system symptoms. So they may not have uh, respiratory symptoms as much as having GI symptoms, or um, you know, sometimes they'll have ear symptoms, sometimes neurological. So they'll have other system involvement. So atypical bacteria, this is the important thing about them. What are they? So first is Legionella, then Mycoplasma. These are the ones which are very relevant to us. Then Chlamydia, uh, Pneumoniae, Cytokai, and Coxiella burnetii. Not as common, and uh, uh, you, know, you may identify it on uh, the panel, the respiratory panel. So Legionella, now this is an important one for us. Um, it may not be common, but it does cause very severe illness. And again, once identified, can be quickly treated with macrolides and fluoroquinolones. It's an aerobic gram-negative bacillus. It's motile, non-acid fast, produces beta-lactamase, so resistant to penicillin. Present in water, natural habitats, as well as in artificial sources, like air conditioning, as we know of, fountains and respiratory therapy equipment, et cetera. So young patient smokers, severe infection, maybe they're an elderly and immunocompromised. Multisystem involvement is not uncommon with mental status alteration, liver enzymes, diarrhea, along with the pneumonia. Travel may be present, not always. And it's sensitive to macrolides, fluoroquinolones, and rifampicin. So the history, the classical history for this is someone who has traveled, lived in a, who's uh, traveled, gone somewhere, stayed in a hotel for a few days, and the air conditioning was infected and numerous people have fallen sick with it. So this is like a very classical history, not always so easy to uh, determine, but Legionella is important. And it is, it can be identified by the urinary antigen and can be aggressively treated and does respond. What about mycoplasma? Mycoplasma is again a different one where we have a lot of extra pulmonary manifestation. There can be neurological manifestation like meningitis of different uh, types, neuropathies. There can be uh, hematological, there can be skin and mucocutaneous, musculoskeletal. This table is not complete, but just to give a sense that this is mycoplasma is the one where you have to look out for other system involvement. So they, they can have skin lesions, uh, classical skin lesions and things like that. Now, typical clinical features include a pharyngitis, sore throat, hoarseness, fever, cough, et cetera. And this indicates infection in the lower respiratory illness. Extra pulmonary manifestations overshadow pulmonary. And this is classical for atypical bacteria. 25% of the patients infected with mycoplasma pneumonia may experience extra pulmonary. So that is the typical and atypical bacteria now coming to respiratory viruses. Now, this is, of course, very key for us. And uh, we've all just about, you know, we are, we are still in the, you know, we are not over the pandemic, but we have recovered from the intense uh, onslaught of the pandemic, at least. So there are two things, uh, mainly influenza and SARS-CoV-2. Now, influenza, I'll just uh, point out a few things. Again, um, I'm not particularly looking at the intensive care perspective of it, but I'll give some wider kind of uh, insights into it. 
Influenza, who does it affect? Again, that same category, you know, the extremes of age, very young, very old, pregnant and postpartum, two weeks of de uh, delivery, chronic medical conditions and uh, immunocompromised. Early treatment with antivirals do reduce symptoms, complications, hospitalization, mortality. So it's important to identify quickly and treat uh, even empirically sometimes, um, and then you know, wait for the report to come back. Vaccination, we're all aware of. Influenza vaccine pre-winter has to be given to everyone uh, in the very young, in the elderly, and anyone above 60, anyone above 50 with chronic illnesses. And now, in fact, it is recommended for everyone since COVID has happened and you know everyone's uh, fearful due of the dual kind of epidemic in winters. Fortunately, it has not happened, but it is a reasonable thing to do. Healthcare workers as well, all of us are, um, you know, uh, it's important for us to take it. And chemo annual vaccination is the best thing. Chemo prophylaxis with antiviral is also used for pre-exposure or post-exposure prevention. Now, one thing to remember is that viral illnesses are highly infectious. Bacterial infections may not be. Bacterial infections may be, uh, may be infectious in people whose immunity is compromised, but in uh, immunocompetent adults, they will not necessarily, one will not transmit one ba uh, bacterial infection from one to the other. On, on the other hand, viral illnesses will transmit to everyone uh, in close contact. So that's uh, something to keep in mind. Influenza and bacterial co-infection. So this is an important thing to, again, very relevant to us because during the flu season, I think all our ICUs get inundated with um, influenza with bacterial infection. And that is a, uh, you know, something for us to be well aware of. There are two things to uh, look into this. One is that, yes, there is co-infection. If there is influenza, there is, uh, the immunity is also compromised and the patients can get superadded bacterial infection. So treat the bacterial co-infection empirically. It's okay to do. Then, uh, so, so people who have suspected influenza uh, and severe disease and those who deteriorate after initial improvement. So again, you know, if there is secondary infection, so there might be an improved, an initial improvement followed by decline. So, so just have a low threshold and these are very valid uh, places to treat such patients. So you have a, um, um, a patient in this situation then. So again, the, the same thing it's pointing out. What about diagnosis of influenza? Uh, again, as we pointed out, rapid molecular tests, like uh, you know the this, uh, nucleic acid amplification, we have that for almost CBNAT is now available for uh, all viruses, SARS-CoV-2, influenza, RSV, et cetera. And then we can do RT-PCR and uh, the part of the respiratory panel. Now, one thing to point out that I haven't really done in a slide form is that, um, Influenza is endemic. I think we all understand these things quite well now. Influenza is endemic. And when any uh, infection becomes endemic, what does it mean? That there are, uh, it is there, you know, in the uh, population. So it exists, it continues to thrive in the population without causing any significant illness. But from time to time, you know, so we all know that during winter time, influenza will, you know, peak. We, we all know that and everybody takes a vaccine, but people still uh, tend to come down with it. Within this peak of influenza in the winter, there will be some severe cases of H1N1. So this is the way uh, the severe illnesses work and perhaps that is the way the uh, SARS-CoV-2 will as well work. So while we have uh, Omicron in our midst or variants and subvariants, et cetera, of that, but from time to time, we cannot say that we are, you know, completely do away with it because from time to time, when there is a peak of the infection, while the majority, 90%, will have 90 to 95% will have very mild uh, upper respiratory tract illness, there will be some who will get the, uh, you know, more severe variant. So these, uh, these variants perhaps are just in abeyance, you know, they don't entirely go away. So that is just uh, uh, something to point out, although I haven't really brought it up here. And uh, from the ICU setting, um, so I'll just, again, even the COVID, now I haven't really prepared many slides for it because these viruses, they come and go, whereas the bacterial infection are what we see all the year around and the, they're the ones which, you know, last much more, but uh, there are, you know, excellent guidelines. And I think, uh, you know, we just, just go over it and the current, all of us know of the evidence or the lack of. And I've just shared just one uh, slide I'll share of the 
typical CTs that we saw at that time. And we saw this kind of, you know, there's uh, extensive consolidation, ground glassing, there's a bit of crazy paving. And then here there is some traction as well, traction bronchiectasis indicating, you know, septal parenchymal stiffening. And then, of course, the good thing was that, again, here also, this is crazy paving, where on top of ground glass, you also have septal. Good thing was that the recovery was there. So after some time, they became like this, where all the ground, the acute ground glassing and consolidation uh, resolved. And then what we were left with was the septal thickening, and that got further better. And there's just some subplural, like a, a plural stripe was uh, left behind. So... Based on this, all I'd like to share is that viral illnesses often cause bilateral disease. They often call, cause interstitial pneumonitis rather than the classical lobar consolidation that a uh, you know, bacterial infection causes. Bacterial is much more uh, unilobar. Uh, and if it is multilobar, multifocal, it just means it's much more severe. But in a viral illness, it is much more common to have a bilateral multifocal kind of disease, which may look like this and definitely during COVID it looked like that and H1N1 will also look like this and uh, and again the things to bear in mind prompt start of antiviral empiric antibiotic don't hesitate and uh, the support the ventilatory support or whatever other support is of course what uh, you know is special cases so this is again more in the remit of hospital acquired but I'll just mention a a couple of things that uh, sometimes we do see the MRSA even community acquired and uh, strongest risk factor for this is previous colonization. So patient may have been in hospital, got discharged and come back a month or so later and maybe in the first and may have come back in the, you know, the second time with a community acquired infection. But then what we find is that it is MRSA and it may be because it was colonized all this time. So that is, uh, you know, one of the reasons and this Empiric, and then empirically, we need to treat them. If we have this history, you know, we don't need to uh, wait for such patients. And then the other thing, I've just faded it out a little bit, is because suspicion for MRSA is, again, that whole cohort of uh, vulnerable people, I, you know, previous IV antibiotic hospitalization, kidney disease, and then certain IVDU, um, then, you know, socioeconomic things, lifestyle, et cetera. Uh, staff can cause a very uh, significant necrotizing cavitary pneumonia. Uh, the other thing is pseudomonas, but of course, I mean, all the guidelines will say pseudomonas because they see this more commonly in the West, but we refer, we will refer to it as the gram-negative uh, bacilli. And again, drug-resistant gram-negative bacilli is, a, um, is something we, we un encounter. And uh, we, known colonization, past infection, hospitalization with IV antibiotics in the last three months. And then, uh, you know, we need to give them an empiric regimen. Pseudomonas is identified as a cause, cause of CAP in 4.2%. So that's not, you know, we can't ignore that. And the isolates were drug resistant in approximately half of the cases. Independent risk factors, prior pseudomonas infection or colonization, bronchiectasis, severe COPD tracheostomy. So as a pulmonologist, we encounter pseudomonas a lot and uh, in bronchiectasis and as COPD. And the thing to know about a pseudomonas is that colonization, so it's, it's not good news. And whenever we isolate it, we have to try and eradicate it because once it's there, it takes root and it'll uh, cause recurrent infection and uh, ongoing lung destruction. So pseudomonas is a very dangerous bacteria. And uh, whenever we treat it, we need to use double antibiotics, one intravenous and one more, which could also be intravenous or oral if it is sensitive to fluoroquinolones. Uh, very often we find that it is resistant to the oral fluoroquinolones and then we, are, we have to do, give either you know, fourth generation cephalosporins or the penems along with the um, um, amikacin uh, with the aminoglycoside uh, group. So pseudomonas of course is a very special case with a separate uh, kind of uh, connotation from the respiratory perspective, but gram negative bacteria that we see in the ICU setting will include Klebsiella, Acentobacter, Pseudomonas, E. coli, etc. And these are, again, the, you know, the, the drug resistant, like we saw that uh, culture report. Coming to treatment. Now, treatment is for uh, straightforward community acquired pneumonia is fairly simple. So I've not you know, kind of gone into too much of that. So initial treatment strategies for outpatient, this is very simple, amoxicillin or doxycycline or micro macrolide. If there's comorbidity, then give double. So I think I would give, for a community acquired pneumonia, regardless, I would give a double antibiotic. One is a simple amoxicillin clavulinate and one is a macrolide. And that would be the standard of practice for everyone. 
And uh, then we come to community uh, acquired pneumonia, severe, more severe, which we've had to admit than typically uh, if, if we have, uh, you know, amoxicillin and uh, clavulinate is that uh, remains, IV remains an option, but typically we would start a, a beta lactam. Well, we, we would start either uh, a cephalosporin, uh, either IV monocef or something along with macrolide or respiratory fluoroquinolone. Respiratory fluoroquinolone, as you're aware, in India, we are very hesitant because of the uh, implications of TB because you know we sometimes don't know someone presents as pneumonia but may have underlying TB and then we render them fluoroquinolone resistant. So that has to be um, borne in mind. So non-severe inpatient and then severe inpatient, uh, we have to bear in mind MRSA coverage, gram-negative coverage, and especially if these recent hospitalization and things are there, then empirically as well, we can do that. We can uh, cover for this. So, um, so, so this is the uh, thing about antibiotics. So just uh, what is the duration of treatment? Five days of antibiotics is usually enough from a, a uncomplicated community acquired pneumonia. So the patient I'd see in OPD, I would just treat for five days, that's enough. But uh, however, if a patient is uh, immunocompromised, has underlying structural lung disease, is not better than seven days. In the ICU setting, often you'll have to give seven days, 10 days, 14 days even. If blood culture grows something, then straight away it's into 14 days. So I think it's very much uh, based on you know where things go. Non-traditional CAP like Legionella, Pseudomonas, Staph aureus, then longer duration as we know, especially if there is bacteremia. Uh, drug resistance, I, I don't know if there's time to go into this, but anyway, you know, the mechanisms of drug resistance, something we have to be familiar with so that um, we, then, you know, th then we, we are, that is part and parcel of our uh, attempts for judicious use of antibiotics. Important trends, as I said, this is of course in the West, decline in strep pneumonia is, uh, it used to be the most frequent, but now it's decreasing because of vaccination and herd immunity in the population. 30% of cases in Europe and 10 to 15% in the US. So higher uptake of vaccine in the US. I don't have data for India. COVID, uh, we have, you know, I have not gone into it because that is again, and I think that's uh, uh, for one entire lecture really. Uh, increased recognition of respiratory viruses. One third of cases of CAP uh, are, end up being respiratory viruses when we use the molecular methods. So I think those are excellent and we must use them. Uh, so single pathogen, sometimes they're co-infections uh, with bacterial CAP and sometimes they just uh, cause dysregulated host immune response. That makes us more prone to uh, bacterial infection. Lung microbiome, just like the gut has a microbiome, the lung also has one, so they are already there. And sometimes they, uh, it, it, it's it, the response, which bacteria causes the pneumonia is often a factor of what the lung microbiome has. So, you know, it may uh, overshadow that or it may be the one, etc. Some newer antibiotics, uh, but not at all used here. So I've not gone into detail as, as uh, but it is FDA approved. So in the future, we may have that, which is a good thing. I think we can do with newer antibiotics whilst trying to save what we already have. And I think with that, uh, I come to a uh, end of this session and I really hope that uh, that was useful. Dr. Gunadhar, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yeah, Gunadhar. Very elaborate so, and uh, very interesting discussion. Yeah, Dr. Gunadhar. Yeah, course. thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, I think it's a it's an extensive talk. Everything has been covered very nicely. Uh, and I think uh, whatever the uh, guidelines and literature is available in the current scenario, I think you have beautifully uh, described it, which will be helpful for our students. So from the intensivist perspective only, I I'd like to mention some few points which is important for the uh, students actually. So. So one is like as you have pointed out, uh, like how to class, how to know that it is a severe pneumonia. So like patients who are sick, who are requiring mechanical ventilators, who are requiring inotropic supports, they are classified as a very severe category of community acquired pneumonia patients. So these patients should be immediately admitted to the ICU. And as an intensivist, they should not forget about the role of resuscitation. Resuscitation in the ER, sending the culture before giving the antibiotics and uh, suspecting the appropriate bug for that particular particular patient who comes from the community. And uh, here the antibiogram of that particular community also matters. Like many of our patients who come to our hospitals, basically if they are in shock, we start with the bl, -BL combination followed by atypical coverage. But in some hospitals that may not be the scenario. 
and uh, the second thing is like scoring system ideally as you have beautifully described like the curve 65 pneumonia severity index the smart cough so uh, so most of them being should be categorized in either of the one form but what is more important is the organ involvement so any patient with community acquired pneumonia having organ involvement obviously the severity increases like if there is a one organ involvement either kidney or liver the severity is more if there is two organ involvement the mortality is high the risk is high the prognosis is poor third thing is like the patient should be treated like uh, uh, like in the proper ventilator strategy like uh, ARDS ventilation if at all because most of them are sick and they are requiring very high PEEP and FiO2 so sometimes though uh, sometimes the proning also help them many of our patient actually we have proned them uh, when they came to the ICU with a severe uh, community acquired pneumonia and that that sometimes help them so the lung protective ventilation strategy sometimes helps in such patients and uh, the other things like uh, uh, very rarely we encounter fungus because most of the times though even if you isolate fungus from the respiratory tract the fungus can never be a cause of the most of the times in pneumonia like candida can never be a, most of the times a cause though in the chronic patients aspergillosis sometimes may be common but most of the times uh, empirical antifungal actually has no role but if the patient subsequently deteriorates we may have to add either amphotericin b or sometimes like caspofungin, okay, as an empirical treatment if the patient is septic shock, not, not recovering. And uh, diagnostic modality, like as you have rightly pointed out, that the ball and mini ball and uh, the, the, the brush specimens, they are of uh, diagnostic value. And the intensivist of the, our students should be able to know about the something called as the, uh, like the, uh, your something that scoring system of the uh, microscopic scoring systems. Okay, so those are also important. And prognostication-wise, we should be able to explain to the family, depending on the organ involvement, what is the chances of mortality of different category of patients who are on ventilator, who are requiring inotropic support, and who are having multiple organ involvement. So in that way, we have to classify to our uh, relatives, uh, of the patient relative, I mean to say, so that uh, you know those will be the documented communication part from our sides. And uh, I really thanks. Uh, you have covered everything extensively. So any questions is there, I think we can take. At least, uh, if you have any questions, yeah, yeah, it yeah. was indeed a wonderful, uh, no, from your side, uh, and you gave a lot of insight. Um, uh, I know uh, what we have seen in our uh, setups as well, like there is growing incidence of uh, multi drug resistant organisms, even with community acquired pneumonia, we've seen a lot of patients with multi drug resistant organisms. Uh, what is the trend that you have also followed up? And uh, we have a lot of uh, discussion about what is the suitable antibiotic even for community acquired pneumonia. Sometimes we use the president as a vector, sometimes we use the presidential vector, sometimes we use uh, you know other combinations like you know, so, so many cell vectors and BT have also been added. Uh, considering that community acquired infections are also. Uh, you know, multi drug resistant uh, organism induced. So, what is your take on this particular entity? Do you, uh, do you also find uh, multi drug resistant organisms even in uh, community acquired infections like pneumonia? Yeah. I'd like so, to hear. Yeah, so certainly I think from the intensivist perspective, you're, you, you know, you will see much more drug resistant bugs in the ICU setting. Now, for us, it is patients who will be on the ward and all that, perhaps not so much. You know, we uh, our first uh, antibiotic of choice for an admitted patient will be a combination of uh, monocef and um, macrolide, you know, clarithromycin, typically. And mostly patients will respond. But yes, you're right. Often we go straight to piptaz and, you know, claribid if we feel that the patient is, you know, has comorbidities because it's, you know, so many of our patients already have COPD, already have uh, cardiac disease or something or the other, and then we feel it is wiser to this thing. But monocef and uh, clarithromycin, otherwise, I think is a good choice. Now, augment and claribid is good for the patients who are being treated on an outpatient basis. So that's not relevant to you, I know. So my uh, uh, kind of so much more uh, from that. Are, 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 yeah, so most of our patients are exposed to uh, healthcare setup. They may be yeah, visiting yeah, exactly, the hospital exactly. or OPD. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's why they become colonizers. Absolutely. Right. 
uh, most common organisms would be pseudomonas probably and you know you know uh, with the structural lung diseases you know we tend to get uh, recurrence of infections and uh, colonizers are also not treated you know adequately at times probably the Absolutely. duration of antibiotics is also not we, we we emphasize on shorter duration of antibiotics like 5 days or maximum 7 days or something like that but we see uh community acquired infections are also you know multi drug resistant so at times we have to give long term uh, two weeks of antibiotics and uh, especially for those patients with COPD like you know uh, COPD though, I don't know whether we should call them as community acquired because they, they will keep on visiting the hospital so they will uh, invariably have health uh, nosocomial uh, infections only so uh, means so good, uh, as far as the penetration of these antibiotics is concerned you know when we compare BL, BLI so which one do you feel has a better penetration uh, when we compare like from intensive perspective like the best in azobactam versus cefalosporin azobactam hmm. uh, what do you think well, so i i still feel i mean so while we have you know cefalosporins we have so many options options are you know ever increasing piperacillin azobactam i feel still has a very good place and uh, we would still preferentially use this but of course cefparazone sulbactam is again you know commonly used for more um, slightly more broad spectrum uh, I, i i guess but uh, from the respiratory point of view i think piperacillin tazobactam would still be a preferred uh, drug for us along with a with a typical cover from the cap uh, setting from the community acquired setting um, so yeah so i think that would be yeah there is one more question uh, like you know in the chat box uh, how do we replace the situation pneumonia yeah i'm mean, sorry pneumonia, i didn't like, yeah. Yeah. I didn't address that at all, but yes, I agree that aspiration is something we see very commonly. But I think the thing to understand about aspiration is the background of the patient. So a patient who has underlying, you know, either a recent stroke or has some, uh, you know, neuromuscular problem, or uh, or or may even have some head and neck surgery. Anything that affects the integrity of the swallowing, and you know, so during swallowing, the throat muscles have to work, um, and the vocal cords have to close completely. So anything that interferes with that mechanism. So more than anything else, I think we know it is aspiration if uh, the patient has these as background, and if the and if the family says that during eating or drinking he starts coughing a lot. So I think these are key indicators. Typical, um, typical chest X-ray changes would be in the right lower lobe because aspiration, aspirated material will always preferentially go there. And then you can confirm it further with a you know swallow assessment and things like that. Um, there is guidelines about whether is it uh, important because we all add anaerobic cover as well in these patients. Additional anaerobic cover, and is it necessary or whether, you know, something like piperacillin, tazobactam can also work just as well. And I think the guidelines say there is uh, no need to add additional antibiotic for aspiration because these cover it just as well. You know, they cover it adequately. But, uh, but I think, again, some degree of clinical judgment. Uh, but this is how I think you, the aspiration and regular pneumonia and aspiration pneumonia is purely history on the basis of history. Yeah, he talked about Legionella infection, which is uh, common with the AMAC environments and all that. So, uh, is there uh, any recommendation? Like, you know, we we have always uh, read in the textbooks only, particularly for Legionella infection, we should simultaneously say in the urinary Legionella antigen. Uh, what is the recent recommendation of that? Do you still follow the protocol of sending urinary antigen for Legionella or just respiratory specimen no so i think the guidelines are very yeah they say that in the case of severe community acquired pneumonia must send the urinary antigen as well either severe community acquired pneumonia or the a history suggestive of exposure like that they do uh, uh, kind of this thing they do they do recommend uh, to send the urinary antigen as well but a, a person who's on the ward and otherwise getting better then it's you know then that's okay yeah so uh, another thing is like steroids so most of the times uh, the steroids actually have no role if you say most of the times the viral pneumonia people tend to use steroid but actually sometimes it is detrimental 
in fact it has to be used only if there is evidence of inflammation like most of the times in covid we have used but uh, sometimes in the uh, in the initial phase after 5 days of the symptoms of community acquired pneumonia when it is not settling down many of the intensives they tend to use steroid so what is your uh, experience on that when do you really use steroid in such so, patients yeah so no i agree i think in the setting of only pure pneumonia i, I think steroids have no role at all uh, the role comes suppose you know we see a lot of copd asthma patients and things like that with pneumonia who will come with a uh, not only a consolidation but also an exacerbation of the airway disease and then it's that's a that's one of the indications certainly second is again you know septicemia and all that sep sepsis dose a low dose steroid may be you know considered but for the pneumonia per se i wouldn't now again viral pneumonia is different when we dealt with covid uh, uh, in the early part, steroids are not to be given because it uh, encourages, uh, it kind of, it is conducive for the viral replication if we give steroids in the beginning. After a certain stage, however, when the bodies, you know, the when we dealt with things like the cytokine storm and all that, probably at that time, I think we had good evidence uh, from the recovery trial that steroids were certainly uh, helped at that point. So yes, definitely a very judicious use of steroid. And for pneumonia per se, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Another question, yeah. Another question like, uh, yeah, so one question is like H1N1 also able to cause uh, of pneumonia and uh, how does it, if it is uh, so, and how good is the sputum positive report of identification of organism, how reliable, how sensitive and specific it is in your so, clinical practice, man. So H1N1 can cause pneumonia, you know, definitely. So the, with the viruses, it's that, uh, as we discussed in the presentation, they can cause pneumonia. It is different to bacterial. Bacterial is much more uh, low bar consolidation and uh, viral is an interstitial pneumonia pattern. So it'll be bilateral, it'll be multifocal, and, you know, it'll not look like a standard pneumonia. But if you uh, do the CT scan and all that, then it'll be much more obvious an interstitial pattern. So H1N1 by itself can cause pneumonia. It can... Uh, cause immune dysregulation and predisposed to superadded bacterial infection and uh, so, so both are uh, possible but yes even by itself viruses can cause pneumonia uh, sputum po positivity now see i i don't know the specificity sensitivity but as i uh, what the data says is that we are able to identify community acquired pneumonia only in 50% of the cases. So obviously, you know, sputum is giving us oh, that much information. Uh, this is in the context of CAP. So maybe just uh, half the people, we will get the diagnosis. Now, if the patient is producing adequate sputum, we must test it because if we get an answer, it will only help us you know, rather than giving multiple antibiotics and things like that. And we have identified a bacteria. We narrow down our treatment to that. So I think sputum must always be done, but it will give you the report. It will give you an answer, maybe only in 50% of the cases. So the sputum should be sent uh, unless put otherwise uh, all patients and, with the respiratory symptoms. Uh, yes, know, yes. Uh, but the volume of the sputum is also very important. Very and, important. Uh, yes. Absolutely. So if there's adequate, yeah. Yeah. and like Dr. Gunadar said, preferably send it you know before antibiotic treatment because a lot of the right, time right. there are so many antibiotics and you know we no culture will ever grow anything so i think best to send off a sample yeah. as soon as possible and then let the antibiotics run. as far as the guidelines are concerned there are many guidelines bps guidelines american society uh, guidelines now indian society of uh, pulmonology also have come up with the guidelines so, which guidelines they should uh, we should we follow for a trainee intensive? If I talk about and yeah. we are like you know in intensive care, uh, yeah. we have the trainee student. It becomes very confusing as yeah. well. Like when we were trainee 15 years back, probably so we also had confusion which guidelines to be followed. Sure. So, what is your take on this? Yeah. I have yeah. these questions in years yeah. together and feel I'm not able to delineate. So, which guidelines we should follow? So I think that's a I, I totally understand. I think that's a very good question. Now, I mean, by and large, so from the respiratory perspective, I think we must have one Indian guideline that we must be familiar with. Uh, so uh, for the from the pulmonary perspective, it's ICS and NCCP, India, Indian Chest Society and NCCP. So they have given us, I think it's 2018 uh, for CAP, the guidelines are there. They are not terribly different or anything, but uh, so, you know, it's good guidelines. Sometimes it gives us a good 
Indian context, you know, so there will be some uh, things which are specific to India. The uh, from the uh, from the uh, Western guidelines, I think American Thoracic Society and IDSA they are very good. They have guidelines on almost all aspects of you know infection. ID, IDSA anyway has for all infectious things and for respiratory specific. I think the ATS and IDSA was a very comprehensive, they, uh, like you know Q and A based. So this is the question: What is the evidence? And then you know what is the uh, guidance. So it's quite a nicely uh, done this thing. So I thought that was good. British Thoracic Society is also very good, but th theirs is very outdated now. The this for CAP at least. So I think it's important to go to the guidances which are uh, in the last you know few years, in the last five years or so, because evidence is changing so rapidly that if we don't, if we take something from 2010, it's probably very grossly outdated. And especially in the field of infection, because new uh, diagnostic, new treatment, so many things are being um, kind of you know discovered. So that would be my take. But yeah, yeah. So a very interesting question by Dr. Viswas. So uh, she is, she wanted to ask: Is is COPD can be totally curable? So is this it? is. Yeah, so see, COPD is a chronic illness. So as you know, chronic illnesses are usually not curable, they are controllable. So by and large, I would say COPD is a chronic disease, uh, you know, and the, the smoking or whatever environmental damage causes extensive irreversible emphysema in the lungs, emphysema or, or you know, airway changes. Uh, so it cannot be reversed, it's irreversible, so it cannot be curable. However, People who have mild COPD, you know, like the initial stage, if they give up smoking and there is no lung damage, you know, perhaps that is the category that may be curable. But for all the rest, I think it's probably something that can be controlled with using inhalers. Yeah, so, you know, so only very early onset who have not smoked that much. But once you have emphysema in the lungs and, you know, your um, um, lung function test is showing airflow obstruction, it is not uh, going to be reversible. So this is different to asthma, which is the other airway disease, which is totally reversible disease. But these are all chronic illnesses. So, you know, chronic illnesses are by and large not curable. So you can control them with treatment. So as far as PCP pneumonia is concerned, you know, it can present in different ways, like atypical PCPs are also very common. And uh, at times it becomes very difficult to identify and uh, you know, culture also. And to culture it is also very, very difficult. You know, so how do we, you know, uh, so, Sorry, I missed that. Uh, what is difficult to culture? Sorry, uh, um, Dr. Anlai, I've PCP. missed that. Yeah, PCP. Yeah, with the yeah, initially yeah, it was the PCP, now it is the yeah. name is changed to uh, PJP, something like that. So uh, it, it becomes very difficult to you know, identify these organisms in culture. So, what is the best way to identify PCP? You know, so you simply by just, uh, you know, uh, basic or uh, sorry, imaging modalities sometimes doesn't help because the ground glassing is seen in many other conditions mm -hmm. as well, even includes. You know, even uh, COVID pneumonia also has a similar kind of picture where you see ground glassing. It becomes very difficult to identify PCP. I know if the patient is a steroid is a compromise, yeah. you know, yeah. where we should have strong index of suspicion for PCP. Yeah. But there are typical presentations. Even if the patient may not be immunocompromised, but there may be a presence of PCP in, uh, in these patients. So how do we diagnose PCP and what will be the best line of treatment? Uh, for PCP infection. Yeah, yeah it no. may not, it may also present as a community acquired disease. Absolutely. Patient, right. You know, directly coming in as community infection. So, but it becomes very, very difficult to diagnose. I agree. So I what, agree. what is your take on this? So, I think, no, I think you're absolutely right. But I think it's uh, the key thing to, uh, again, I think a lot depends on the underlying conditions. So obviously PCP, we will be expecting in someone who's already immunocompromised, you know, in some way, you know, it can be because of underlying malignancy, chemotherapy, or it can be a hematological malignancy, which is often one of the, and of course, HIV and all, you know, depending on what the, uh, in India, obviously it's not that uh, prevalent, but so I think the first thing is that the patient has to be uh, immunocompromised, the, only then we start suspecting it. And then once we suspect it, 
I agree with you. Diagnosing is not always easy because it, it is only the methanamine silver stain or, uh, you know, some uh, like the microbiological, this thing which doesn't always give us. I think a good clinical suspicion is also okay. And, uh, and a combination of septrin and uh, steroids is, is good. I mean, high dose septrin, of course, for a, um, so, so I, I, for sure, we have given it empirically when we have a very strong suspicion, although one would feel much more confident when you actually, uh, you know, have the microbiological confirmation for it. Uh, other things, of course, desaturation. I mean, you know, people do the walk test and the patient desaturates and in a background of um, immunocompromised with uh, classical ground glassing in the center with peripheral sparing. So, so if everything adds up, then I think... Yeah. So I think, uh, Madam, yeah. So you are rightly, absolutely true. So in the background of immunocompromised patient who are rapidly hypoxic, rapidly deteriorating with uh, some component of uh, lung injury and suspicious of pneumonia. So probably this, there, this is where the, the, the PCP pneumonia actually should be taken in the high index of suspicion. So that is the key actually. So uh, once you suspect, then only uh, we, we can send the different test. So that is where the your clinical judgment and uh, your uh, patient management uh, play a very vital role. What I suppose. So 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 okay. So that's that's a very good discussion. With the interest of time, I think uh, we need to close uh, today's session. And I really thanks, Madam, for uh, uh, giving this uh, talk to all our uh, budding intensivists. And hope to see you soon in the future in uh, in this on our our platform many times. And uh, really thanks from all our Apollo team, Apollo Navi Mumbai team, I can say. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Dr. Gunadar. Thank you, Dr. Akhle. Thank thanks. you, Dr. Honor to be here. Honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.